Thank you. I'd like to start by thanking the organizers. Uh, being on the last day of the conference may not be an advantage to a lot of people, but in my case, it turned out to be a great advantage, and I hope you'll see that as we get started. Um, last year, we briefed the Lattice Energy Converter at the, at the conference, and at that time, we were producing a few nanowatts of, of power. We think we've made about two orders of magnitude improvement since then, and I'm convinced that with the help of the people here, we can do much better. Okay, back to 1989. You know, when, when the, this was announced, oh, the scientist says, you know, it's not repeatable. Uh, you don't have any replications, no peer-reviewed publications. Uh, one of the things I thought about this morning when, when the NASA people were talking was, uh, they have neutrons, and the, and the comment there was, if you don't have neutrons, you know, you, you, where are the dead graduate students? Remember that comment? Uh, uh, so, anyhow, we have a device that will spontaneously self-initiate, self-sustain the production of a voltage and current through an electric load, and it has been replicated by people. And as I stated last year, we need to scale up by six to ten orders of magnitude. So progress since that time, uh, probably one of the biggest areas of progress is we think we have developed a better understanding of the gas ion dynamics. Uh, a continuous supply of ions is required to produce the sustained current that we're seeing. And furthermore, the energy that's being produced, it comes from whatever is ionizing the gas. Recombination, you're gonna hear that word a lot in this presentation. It reduces the current collected by at least two orders of magnitude, and it could be much more. And I'll say a little bit more about that. Uh, current experiments, as I said, are producing one to two orders of magnitude more power per square centimeter than a year ago. And we believe there are multiple opportunities to, to scale up. We've switched to the flat electrode design, which also allows scaling up much easier, and actually it makes the cell much easier to produce. And the supporting analysis, uh, I can't go through all of this. My coworker Harper Whitehouse has been working on that, and, and he's got a PowerPoint presentation complete with a lot of notes pages that, that we'll be posting on the web. Okay, here's an example of the flat cell. Uh, you know, here, here are a couple flat cells here. Uh, you know, they're less than a quarter inch thick. Uh, and, and so you can stack several of them. Here's one in a, in a glass jar. Uh, this, the electrode is over here. Here I've got a, a side view of it here so you can see. This one has a carbon electrode with particulate on it that I harvested after co-deposition. It sank to the bottom of the, of the electrolyte. And I thought, why should I throw that away? So I siphoned off the electrolyte. Uh, got down to where it was mostly particulate, uh, used a pipette and, and put that on the carbon, set it in the sun and let it dry, uh, wrapped some PTFE pipe tape around it to build up enough so that when I put a counter electrode on, I didn't have a, have a direct contact, and that was my cell. And this is the cell I'm gonna show the data, the data on later. One of the other experiments we did uh, was an attempt to replicate Kramer's results. Last year we reported that uh, J.B. Kramer had, had reported in a speech that if a thick layer of monazite sand uh, was placed between a couple of electrodes, he, he was producing three times two to the minus four amps of current in a relatively small area cell. The only place we found that reference was it was reported that he made that statement in a speech, and we checked with the organization he worked with and the librarian there, and they could not find any other reference to, to it. We also conducted tests with thorium dioxide uh, and a decorative sand, and, and per our calculations, we shouldn't have seen anything. Um, when we did test, some of them, we did see the sand and our seat we see saw some voltage and current. But if we heated the cell up and dried it out, it went away. So what we think uh, 
Kramer was measuring was actually an electrochemical reaction between the carbon and the zinc electrodes he was using. And we think he probably came to that conclusion because he did not publish these results. And surely, had he not had that conclusion, this would have been something that he would have published. And oh, by the way, he's not the first one to do that. Uh, Volta, when he, in the 1799-1800 time frame, when he was testing electrodes he, for the contact potential difference, uh, he found that when he used zinc, that was really great and produced a much larger current but at that point he was producing electrochemical reactions. One of the other things that we were concerned about was here's kind of a schematic of our cell and we used high, you know, the, the material we used here was like a high temperature epoxy and, and as the electrically insulating material between the both the high and the low working function electrode. We had tested these, measured the resistance at lower temperatures and, and it was basically infinite on any voltmeter that we had. However, we were concerned, well, if we, if we increase the temperature, is the resistance going to change? So we did a series of tests and sure enough, we found that in the high temperature epoxy, when you get up to about 110 degrees, it was, it was a pretty good resistor. At that point, it started to change. And in fact, it didn't just change in resistance, it became a solid state electrolyte, i.e. there were mobile ions in the electrolyte or in, in the polymer. So uh, this was a surprise. Uh, we initially thought that we, we, if the resistance changed here, we would have another parallel path for current to go so, so we weren't getting all of the current through the load. Now it turned out that maybe we were actually producing some current uh, through the, the uh, ions in, in the solid state electrolyte. So we tested a lot of these things because is there some way we could use this feature, you know, rather than, than ionizing gas, if, we could, if there were, we could produce ions for less than 35 EV per ion pair, this might be a winner. So, so we did a whole bunch of tests and to, to check that out. We tested um, high temperature epoxy using nickel and aluminum wires. Uh, you know, we used it with two nickel wires. Uh, we pulled the high temperature epoxy. You can make, turn it into an electrode if you, if you applied a, a potential while it was curing. We did that. Uh, high temperature epoxy with PD particulate actually mixed in to the epoxy. Then we decided, well, hey, uh, is there another standard that we could use? So we got some electrode gel electrolyte. This is what the doctor uses when they, to get a good connection between your body and, and whatever sensor it is. And, and we thought this would be something standard that we, you know, we wouldn't have the variability uh, that you might have with a high temperature epoxy or, or other things. So we used that and we mixed particulate in and we even used deionized water between two nickel plates. The reason we did that was Darrow predicted in 1932 that diffusion would in fact produce a voltage and current and if, if, even if you don't have an electric field. So two nickel plates, you're not going to have an electric field, there is no work function difference. And what we discovered was Darrow was correct. It was not a very big signal, but it was definitely a signal that, that was produced. And so material is, is important in this because you want to avoid the potential for a chemical reaction. Okay, once we had done that, by the way, we discovered that PTFE and silicon rubber were by far the best over the temperature ranges we checked. Uh, they changed very little. And, and so we switched exclusively to using PTFE, Teflon tape, and Teflon, and silicon rubber. And one of the interesting things about the cell is, you know, we, we can hook a voltmeter here. So we know that between these two points, this is positive and this is negative. What that means is that electrons are flowing this way from the low work function through the load and over to the high work function. Great, that's what you would expect. But now how do we complete the circuit? What that means is in the gas, we've got to transfer electrons from the high work function 
to the low work function. Our transfer electric charge from the high work function to the low work function. And this is counterintuitive, but it can be explained by ion diffusion. And so you know, you're going to hear more about diffusion because we believe that is actually what is driving this particular device. And if the load resistance is high, the voltage between the, the, these two is a high, it actually approaches what the, what the uh, difference in work function is. As you reduce the load, then, then the, the voltage drops, it, the electric field here drops, and, and so you actually get more uh, ions transferring. But at that point, you also have a lot more recombination of the ions. They would just as soon recombine as transferred to one of the electrodes. This graph uh, came from the, the jar that I showed, and, and this is one of our cells, and, and you can see uh, we, we started out between the carbon and aluminum. We had about a, a one volt difference in, in, in work function. And so when we first hooked, hooked it up, and, and, and this is through one mega ohm, uh, and, he, and here was here was the voltage we measured at that one mega. As we reduced the voltage, I mean the resistance, the voltage dropped. And using Ohm's law, you can calculate the current you're producing. You could also calculate the power that you're producing. So, what you see is that that initially, you know, the, the current was coming up, and and the current came up a total of three orders of magnitude from here to here, while the voltage went down two orders of magnitude. But what's even more impressive is the current had gone up about two and a half orders of magnitude, while the voltage dropped about a half an order. And, and, and you'll see that the, the maximum power occurs where diffusion matches the, the voltage of the, the electric field that's produced. The other thing that's interesting in this is you can see how the, the uh, current kind of levels off. And we attribute that to as you get a smaller and smaller electric field, the ions are in the zone longer. They can recombine much faster, or many more can recombine. And in fact, when we do some of the calculations, actually some tests that we've done when we operate the cell like an ion chamber, we can see a minimum of about two orders of magnitude and, and some of the analysis, I almost even hate to say it because it's hard to believe, you get up to five to six orders of magnitude, more ions that are being produced. The other thing that the, we have observed in other experiments is that the number of ions produced changes as you apply more voltage, but the change in voltage from one volt to you know, a few millivolts is not going to make that much difference. So if you assume that we're losing two orders of magnitude here instead of about one uh, milliamp of current, which by the way is, is 6.24 times 10 to the 15th charge carriers per second, a lot. Uh, if it would be easy, reasonable to assume that we are producing at least two orders of magnitude more current or more ions, and that would be throughout this whole range. And, and we're more of them recombining on this end because the, the electric field is preventing them from, from getting to the electrodes. More of them are recombining on this end because the drift is slow because there is no, uh, the electric field is very low. So based on that, we believe the LEC is a diffusion driven device and we actually want to work at this end and see what we can do. This is where we believe uh, some of the advantage can be. The equations, this is where Harper comes in, uh, but here's uh, the equations that the, this is actually the first one here are two equations because there's a plus and a minus, where Q is the generation, recombination is here, and by the way, alpha, is, the number we've been using there is, is roughly 10 to the minus 6, that's what uh, uh, Thompson and others have used. Uh, we have diffusion and you have your, your electric field uh, term. Uh, you can subtract these two and, and come up with the current. And what you see here is that 
if the electric field is zero, I still have diffusion. If the diffusion is zero, we still have electric field. And that's something that we've observed, we reported on that uh, two or three times. We've seen, you know, the, the voltage come down and then at a particular point, it just drops and, and you start seeing a diffusion process rather than electric field. They do not decay to zero at the same time. Um, by examining the individual terms of these equations, we've tried to make some, some guesses as to what the significance is, what are the sensitivities that we might be able to apply, and, and we've also had the advantage that we could plug in some of the experimental data that we have in the lab. For example, we know how much, in the case of that we're, we are collecting, uh, 10 to the 15, you know, uh, one milliamp of current. That's what we collect. That's after the recombination. So, so we can plug in some of these numbers and begin to see how, how can we change them. And one of the things that's very important, for example, is, is the separation distance between the electrodes. Okay, previous analysis. Uh, what you're going to see here is in most previous analysis, the diffusion term was ignored. You know, if you're in what Thompson was doing, he was applying, he was just trying to conduct ions through a gas. And the way to do that is you apply a, a strong potential, and as you increase the potential, you begin to sweep out more and more ions, and ultimately it comes up and it, and it levels off and saturates. Uh, we have never seen saturation in our cells. In fact, when we've applied um, some of them that we've used in that mode, we see it actually go up exponentially or increase as we increase the voltage. Uh, Riki and Darrow, uh, Riki in 1903 and Darrow in 1932, both derived the second order nonlinear differential equations that include ion recombination, electric field, diffusion terms, Three but minutes. they could not find an analytic okay. solution. However, Riki. Three minutes. No, oh, okay. Riki did get some solution by successive approximation. Tate solved the fourth order differential equation using numerical means. Omar has a patent where he, he addresses all these things but um, doesn't really solve and he was using a, a known source to ionize the gas and then Rosen and George did an analytic analysis uh, with recombination but without diffusion. I think you'll agree the LEC is a very unique device and it shows that it doesn't saturate. I've mentioned that. The experimental data shows when the electric field is high, the increase in ionizing radiation is offset by the reduction in ions. Uh, I think I've covered all these, but in the light power output peaks when diffusion of ions matches their electric field in induced drift. So understanding the characteristics, it's very unusual electrical physical ion migration rather than electrochemical oxidation reduction cell. Uh, the potential difference or Volta is one of the critical parameters, but the electric field and diffusion oppose each other. I didn't point that out in this slide, but when you look at the equations, uh, they, they tend to work against each other. Uh, the LEC cells we think are diffusion driven. We've operated them at multiple temperature ranges. Uh, they work with many types of electrode materials, and this is where I think you can come in. Uh, Omar has a patent where he used a, a known radiation source, but he learned a lot from that in that patent. And the LEC cell implementation that reduces recombination could be the key to producing a significant power device. What we think we know and don't know, we don't know how the gas is being ionized. We don't know where it's being ionized. That would help us define what the electric field is in the cell. Um, active materials produce more ionizing radiation would help. You saw that in the equation, if we can increase that. And a lot of work is being done in this community right now, looking for nanomaterials and so on. Uh, the importance of ion diff diffusion is an area of research that has been inadequately studied. And for the most part, it's been assumed to be not important. 
and exploring numerical modern plasma techniques, or last night, uh, if Florian, I think, is still here, maybe we could model what's going on in the plasma using some of their, their techniques, and th some of these ideas would be great for master's and PhD students, Oper opportunities for collaboration. If you're one of the people who briefed here on nanomaterials or active materials, I know who you are, and I'm probably going to be contacting you because I think would you, you could put this. Okay. Okay. I think you could put this in in a cell and and produce it. Universities have equipment that two guys working in a garage don't have. Uh, conclusion: multiple opportunities to scale up the LEC, and we think you can contribute. I'd like to acknowledge and thank the people who helped make this successful. And specifically, I'd like to remember Stan Spock. He was a, born in the U.S. when his parents were there going to school. They moved back to Poland when he was two. Uh, he was here until 1948 and then returned to the U.S. where when he went to graduate school, he met Bockrist and, and Flashman. And the three of them maintained their friendship and relationship you know, right up until they passed away and would, would oftentimes uh, write letters back and forth. And Stan is best remembered for his contribution to the, the art of, of co-deposition, which probably has been the most used way to prepare an electrode. And I can't go to Poland, come to Poland and not recognize one of your native sons. So thank you for your attention and... Thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? Oh, please. I wonder, as I know you have submitted a couple of papers already. I, I, I'm sorry, I can't hear it. I don't know if that mic's not on or... It's uh, working. We have more. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know, Frank, that you have uh, already submitted a couple of patents, and uh, I think, are you, are you looking to extend more patents on the technology? And do you need yeah. support and help with that? We have, we have three patents that have been issued, and we have a fourth patent pending that covers some of the things that we did here. But every one of those patents anticipates that there will be improvements in the source of the ionizing radiation. So if someone's got something that works, you know, we can use it in our patent, but you can patent whatever it is that you have. And, and you know, it, it's one that you, you share royalties or the, the agreement. I'm, I'm not sure how all that stuff works, but uh, so anyhow, I don't believe the fact that we have patents should inhibit anyone because that is the area that, that is very important and that's what people here are working on. I think there may be a few people to put you on speed dial then, because as you know, I've replicated it's your work and many others have, and we know the LEC is a, is a solid, reliable phenomenon. Yeah, it's, analyzing the phenomenon is a difficult part, but it's so easy to do, and uh, I, th I, th I hope that uh, we've already had, which I forwarded to you, one request from a university, one, one of their assistant professors wants to use it, as a demonstration tool, just to show his students something which is impossible. And I wish that would happen a bit more, but good luck with it all. Yeah, and uh, I'm sure you'll get more collaborators because you've been incredibly open and generous, which is super, a revelation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Alan. We, we've thought about that, and, and one of the things we've said we don't, we describe as we don't require any naturally radioactive material, but after listening to the to Binya with her report on NASA today, uh, you know, we've been concerned, do we really know what the radiation is? At this point, we don't. Uh, you go back to the early 90s when uh, Rout and Serenity Varson at, at Bark were trying to figure it out. They would fog film, but even with their best instrumentation, they couldn't detect it. And they ultimately said it was an unknown agent that was fogging the film. So, uh, Maybe that unknown agent will work in a lek that was would not work in the instrumentation they were trying to detect uh, with. I don't know, but but the fact is something is is ionizing the gas. 
Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Nice presentation. <laughs> so, uh, next speaker is uh, Robert.